Welcome to the High One Heritage Park and Museum. The centerpiece of this Jefferson County open space park is the High One Museum, a 25 room log house built between 1893 and 1918. The museum is operated as a partnership between Jeffco Open Space and the Evergreen Mountain Area Historical Society. Before the house was built, the property was purchased by a Denver doctor as a summer retreat for her and her family. Josepha Williams and her mother, Mary Neosho Williams, came to Colorado from New York in the 1880s so that Joe could attend the Gross Medical College in Denver. Obtaining her medical license in 1889, Dr. Joe became one of the first female physicians in Colorado. Like many Denver residents today, Dr. Joe and her mother came to the mountains to escape the summer heat. In 1893, Dr. Joe bought over 100 acres of land for $237 in back taxes. With nothing but a ramshackle barn on the property, the family and their friends stayed in fancy tents under the shade of the Ponderosas with a cooling creek running through the grove. They called their summer place Camp Neosho, after Mary's middle name and birthplace in Oklahoma. Soon, however, a desire for comfortable indoor spaces led Dr. Joe and Mary to commission a local carpenter and stonemason named Jock Spence to make the barn livable and build the first rooms of the house. The two-story octagonal tower, now the museum entrance, was built around 1898 and was used as a sitting room and library with a bedroom upstairs. Jock Spence built this uniquely shaped space from local fir and pine without power tools Imagine the geometry and craftsmanship that went into making eight equal corners of notched logs. The interior walls are lined with built-in, handmade bookshelves with adjustable shelves. The ceiling planks still bear the teeth marks from the sawmill blades used to cut them. Spence also included artistic touches such as relief crosses on the trim and a stair-step motif that is carried throughout the whole property. This large fireplace is double-sided and shares a chimney with its other half in the next room. This room was once an old barn, but Jock Spence turned it into a grand living area and music room for Dr. Joe and her husband. Josepha married an Episcopal clergyman, Charles Winfred Douglas, in 1896. Father Douglas, seen here in a late portrait, was a church musician and scholar known for his revival of medieval chant in Episcopal hymns. He even rewrote the Episcopal hymnal in 1941. This room had two pianos in it at one time, including this upright Steinway, which belonged to Father Douglas. Dr. Joe and Father Douglas had one son, Frederick, known as Eric, born in 1897. Eric was also an accomplished violinist and singer. The whole family was interested in American Indian art and culture, and Father Douglas took Eric on several trips to the Southwest to collect Native art. This early interest turned out to be Eric's passion and vocation, as he became the first curator of Native Arts at the Denver Art Museum and a noted expert around the world. Most of the artifacts in this room are not original to the family or house, but were collected in the spirit of recreating the space as the Douglas family would have lived in it. This room, the formal dining room, links the old and new sections of Camp Neosho. It was the first part of the new addition to be built after Mary Neosho Williams' death in 1914. The design of the room, with its spacious windows, built-in storage under the window seats, and incorporation of nature, is reminiscent of some elements in Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie houses. Jock Spence carried through the stair-step design in many places in this room. Notice the extensive plywood throughout the room. This was early for such a large-scale use of plywood which was primarily used in smaller pieces and to make door panels. Spence would have probably had to commission all of these specialty panels. The dining room table was built by Jock Spence especially for this room. The later hickory chairs were originally covered with horsehair and later recovered with Hereford cowhide, a reminder of the Haiwan Hereford cattle raised here when this was the headquarters for the Haiwan Ranch. The paintings on the walls were painted by Eric Douglas and depict Navajo Ye figures, or spirits invoked during healing ceremonies. The large round shield painted on the window seat uses symbolism from the Zuni people.
The butler's pantry connects to the kitchen and was for storage of china, linens, and silver. The hand crank telephone is original to the home. In order to cook for and serve the large parties in the dining room, a fully outfitted kitchen was mandatory. Originally part of the 1914 expansion, this kitchen was remodeled in the 1930s. The wood stove was replaced by this gas range with three ovens and a warming oven. It still works. Fourth graders make journey cake in it on their field trips. The large ice box was built into the wall. Ice was loaded in the top from the back porch by the ice man who would read the sign placed in the window to know how many pounds were required. The numerous kitchen items are from the 1920s and 30s. This room was formerly Father Douglas's study. Notice the octagonal shape, echoing the first octagonal building from the 1890s. Part of the room has been furnished with antiques from the Douglas era with special focus on Father Douglas's pastoral and musical career. The piano and the photo on top are from the Evergreen Conference, a six-week summer school of church music founded by Father Douglas. It was a summer retreat for visiting faculty and clergy candidates until the 1990s. Notice the ingenious way to get hot water on demand in the back of the fireplace. Here Spence put in exposed water pipes, and when the fire roared, water ran through these pipes and went into a storage tank in the kitchen to be kept warm. This room was Father Douglas's personal and family chapel. It was completed in 1918 and was only accessible by a narrow stairway from the study below. Notice the beautiful wood joinery, the vaulted ceiling and laminated arches held together by hand wrought nuts and bolts. The hand leaded window panes are framed and capped by a piece of rosewood carved in a modified trefoil shape. The banners are reproductions of the originals designed by Father Douglas, which hung in the meeting house of the Evergreen Conference. The music playing is a recording of Douglas's compositions performed during a mass at St. John's Cathedral in Denver. Father Douglas died in 1944. It's hard to imagine now, but this gorgeous chapel was used as a girl's bedroom during the 1960s. It had pink paint on the walls, pink carpet on the floors, and her bed was in the niche where the altar is now. Down a short flight of stairs, added in the 1930s, is Dr. Joe's bedroom. During the last years of her life, she was often bedridden and spent much of her time between this room and the chapel. Dr. Joe had a live-in nurse who could be summoned with the help of a button. Collected by Eric and his father on their trips through the Southwest, the Hopi tiles embedded around this fireplace are one of the artistic treasures of Camp Neosho. Hopi artists made tiles like this around the turn of the 20th century, mostly for the tourist trade. Flat tiles are very difficult to make, as the slabs tend to curl as they dry and can break or warp in the changeable temperatures of a wood-fired kiln. Connected to the hallway outside Dr. Joe's room via a door hidden in the closet, this room once served as a bedroom for Dr. Joe's resident nurse. Now this room is a recreation of a turn-of-the-century children's nursery to showcase the crib that was used in the raising of Josepha, as well as her son Eric and his children. Dr. Joe passed away in 1938, and her family decided to sell Camp Neosho. The home, outbuildings, and 1,100 acres were purchased by Tulsa oil man Darst Buchanan, who wanted to try his hand at cattle ranching. This room, a former bedroom, is dedicated to the Buchanan family. The walls are hung with photos of the Haiwan Ranch and the Buchanan family. Also displayed are some of the original ranch furnishings, branding irons, and family books and memorabilia. 
It was Mrs. Ruth Buchanan who gave the name Haiwan to their new home. The word is an ancient Anglo-Saxon term, meaning the members of a family or a religious group. The Buchanans continued buying land connecting to the original parcels, eventually owning thousands of acres on which they raised their special breed of Haiwan Hereford cattle. Darst once paid $61,000 for a breeding bull, which was more than he paid for Camp Neosho. The couple had three daughters, Betty, Joan, and Barbara, who with their husbands and children, all took part in the managing of the ranch from the 1940s to the late 1950s. Darst Buchanan began selling off parts of the ranch to property developers in the late 1950s, a process his family continued after his death in 1960. The Haiwan name can be found in neighborhoods throughout Evergreen, evidence that they were once part of the Haiwan Ranch. The last residents of this home were Joan Buchanan Landy and her children. Her daughter Wendy, as the only girl, chose to make her bedroom in the former chapel. Today, her pink bedroom is recreated here to give visitors a sense of the 1960s teenager's space while preserving the original purpose of the chapel. Once Joan's children left home, it became too much house for her. She sold the Haiwan Ranch home, outbuildings, and 19 acres to a condominium developer in 1973. Fearing the destruction of a Jefferson County landmark, Evergreen residents banded together to form the Jefferson County Historical Society, now the Evergreen Mountain Area Historical Society, with the purpose of saving Haiwan. They appealed to the recently established Jefferson County Open Space to purchase the home for preservation. This began the long partnership of the two organizations to protect and interpret the history of Camp Neosho and Haiwan Ranch. The Haiwan Museum opened to the public in August 1975. Thank you for your interest in the Haiwan Heritage Park and Museum. We look forward to welcoming you again soon.